All right. <coughs> Thank you all. I'll get us going uh, really quick here. Um, another person that needs no introduction is Justin Drake, a uh, researcher with the Ethereum Foundation. And he's got a very tight schedule, so we'll go ahead and pass it right over to him. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, so today I, I'd like to do a bit of a retrospective on the, the design of the beacon chain and, and try to highlight some of the mistakes that we made uh, and basically explain how you know, we messed up, but maybe we can improve, improve next time. Um, and yeah, I, I think that you know, we have made significant mistakes. So if we hadn't made these mistakes, Ethereum would be you know, really, really awesome. But uh, we have made some mistakes and uh, let, let's have a look what these are. Um, so I've split the mistakes in kind of two sections. One, like painful today, obvious mistakes, and then you know, things that might come bite us uh, in, in, in the future. So uh, I think that the, the biggest mistake that we've made that's, that's biting us today is the, the, the max effective balance. So we, we capped the, um, the amount of ETH per validator to 32 ETH. And the reason why we did that is for sharding. We, we used to have a sharding design with these sharding committees and it was kind of important that the sampling was done very, very smoothly. You didn't want any lumpiness with very big validators um, kind of over overflowing like one, one of the committees. But with dank sharding, we have this awesome new design which doesn't require committees. So we don't need to cap the validators. So that's pure technical debt in, in my eyes. And that comes with consequences. It's like unnecessary friction for the validators. We have way too many, va many validators. We have roughly speaking a factor of 100 blow up uh, like operators to validators. So roughly a million validators and roughly 10,000 operators, um, a big overhead there. Um, and we also have suboptimal compounding. If you have 32 ETH uh, right now in order to, to, to do the compounding, you need to wait until you have 64 ETH. And so when you have 33, 34, 35 ETH, you're, you're not making use of that uh, additional uh, ETH as a, as a solo validator at least. And the obvious thing here is just to remove the, the, the max balance. Uh, and the, the way that we plan on doing that is in two steps. One is to increase the maximum effective balance from 32 ETH to 2048, but also eventually just completely remove it because uh, we won't need it in, in, in the long term. Now in, in terms of like this one mistake, that has like rippling consequences. So for example, the fact that we have too many validators uh, puts a lot of load on the clients but it also means that future upgrades are harder. So for example, enshrine PBS, which requires two rounds of attestations, harder. Um, single start finality, which also requires an extra round uh, of attestations, much harder to do. Uh, it means you know, we have longer slot times. It means that we have um, you know, maybe unnecessarily high uh, minimum uh, deposit. So we could be having 16 ETH validators or 8 ETH validators. But because, uh, because of this one design mistake where we're, we have 32 ETH uh, validators right now. Okay, um, and I guess the, the compounding is, is you know, obviously a source of unfairness, it's a source of centralization, uh, it's not a good look. Um, and uh, it, it also has impact on the withdrawal queue because right now what happens is that as soon as you have a little bit more than 32 ETH, don't know if you've, you've observ observed that, but basically you have these partial withdrawals that will sweep uh, the extra balance from all the validators. And that takes a whole week, more or less, to sweep through the whole validator set. And that uh, you know, means that if you want to do a full withdrawal as opposed to a partial withdrawal, you have to pay the cost of waiting roughly, uh, roughly a whole week, which is you know, totally unnecessary. Okay, next big mistake, which is actually very much related to the first mistake, which is the, in, uh, the, the committee index. So we used to have these shard committees, and there was an associated committee index uh, and what's happening is that at every slot, uh, we have um, different committees that are signing different messages. And it, it, it in the previous design, basically, each shard would have its own state route, uh, and so it was kind of normal to kind of index them uh, because the these will be different messages signed. But um, turns out that now we can have all the validators sign the exact same attestation, um, and BLS uh, aggregation works like works basically when it's the same message that's being signed. That's the, 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 the key trick. Um, and so we have like roughly speaking 64x overhead on, s on verifying signatures, which is pretty crazy. Um, and it, it also affect, well it affects normal clients, but it also affects uh, light clients. 
Like if you want, if you want to snarkify the beacon chain, now you need to have a circuit which can verify, you know, uh, all the pairings to do to do the signatures. So that's a, a very kind of silly mistake in hindsight that that is causing a lot of pain. Uh, and the obvious um, you know fix is just to remove the the committee index. Um, this one is also kind of big face palm. Um, basically, we <laughs> we have this feature which is completely unnecessary whereby we're, we're gating withdrawals with a BLS signature, um, but like withdrawals where? Uh, and like eventually it's back to, to ETH1 and, and so we're causing all this unnecessary friction with the initial validators that had to set up you know, cold storage without a hardware wallet because there was no support for BLS signatures and then all the stress, I don't know if you've gone through the stress of like going from 0x00 to 0x01, it's, it's like um, you know, not, not nice. Uh, and then there's like this useless feature that's there uh, that's like not, not, not helping. So we messed up here as well. Um, next up, proposal rewards. So this, this is kind of a fun one, it's one that I, I realized only uh, recently, but basically uh, right now there's this proposal lottery. Uh, roughly speaking, once every four months, as a validator, you win the proposal lottery, you get to propose a block, and you get some, uh, some issuance that corresponds to, to this to this, uh, to winning the lottery. Um, and really what we should have done is we should have done a proposal penalty in case you're offline. So you, s you still want an incentive to be online, but instead of having a reward which creates this, this high variance, you want to have a penalty in case you're not offline. And most of the time, like 99% of the time, folks are online. And so it would be like a completely flat uh, you know, a APR and, re and reward curve. Um, and you know, this, this variance is calling is one of the reasons why we have you know, this pooling. Um, and it also makes future upgrades harder. So for example, we want to do stake capping, uh, where we, we, we have this, this issuance curve which goes uh, towards negative infinity once you reach this, this stake cap. And in order to do that safely, you need the, 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 the variance to be very, very low. Uh, so so this, is, this is a fix that we could do uh, you know, at some point in the future. Um, okay, issuance curve, kind of uh, talking about issuance. One, I mean, I think we did a pretty good job with the issuance curve, but uh, one thing in hindsight is that I think we're just overpaying for security. We have a huge amount of, of, of economic security right now, almost 60 billion, uh, and I think we could have like reduced by a factor of two uh, the, the, the issuance. And then another thing that we kind of messed up a little bit is that there's no, there's no state capping. And that would have been like extremely easy to do if we had, you know, thought about it er earlier on. Um, basically, is this idea that you know, if you want to have a, a, a maximum amount of stake, let's say 30 million ETH, then as soon as you start getting close, close to to to, to this, uh, so the amount of stake gets close, the 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 issuance goes goes negative. Um, and then there's also no stake lower bound. So if there's for some reason there's like a very small amount of, of ETH staked, you know, let's say only one million ETH, there's no real incentive uh, to, 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 to really push people to, to stake and, and increase the economic security. And that we can do something similar but where basically the issuance curve like starts growing very, very fast as soon as you're below kind of a safe, a safe threshold. And like the, the, instead of a square root, basically my suggestion is to use a cotangent, which basically starts at, at infinity and then goes goes to zero and then negative infinity. Okay, uh, fork choice bugs. Um, so we've, we've had mainnet issues um, and you know, not, not great, uh, but also you know, it's just caused so much, um, so much friction for, th for the developers and, and, and various researchers, including academics, because we've had these academics look at our fork choice rule, they find like all these little edge cases and then we try and fix it, and the process of fixing the fork choice rule introduces more, more, more attack vectors, and then there's this cat, cat and mouse where we keep fixing and breaking. Um, and it's just very resource intensive. Uh, and it, you know, it's also not, not, not a great look. Um, so really, what we're working towards, and I think we're you know, getting close, is basically a provably secure fork choice rule, which is, which is bulletproof and, and won't have to be, to be fixed on a continuous basis. Ejection balance. So right now we have this process where if your balance reaches 16 ETH, you get automatic automatically ejected uh, from the beacon chain. Um, and, what, and unfortunately there's about 0.2% you know, of validators that are just permanently offline. 
and like uh, you know these zombie validators that are just 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 leaking e4 for, for for no real reason and they also kind of affecting to a small extent the the liveness of the chain um and so it's just unnecessarily harsh to to those validators and it's all very inflexible and so really what we want to be doing is having faster ejections and also more dynamic e e ejections. so if if you know you have 99% of the validators that are online, then it's, it's actually safe to eject people that, that go offline. But if you have a mass you know, problem where like, I don't know, 80% of validators go offline, you don't want to eject. You want to give them a chance to come back in. Um, so you want to have this dynamic logic uh, to take care of that. The effective balance. Um, so right now we basically have one ETH increment on the effective balance. Um, and it was done as an optimization to, to improve the, the merkleization, but I, th I think it's probably unnecessary uh, complexity. Um, and it also adds uh, you know, problems to the compounding, right? Because if you, if you have uh, you know, 31.9 ETH, you know, you have now you have 0 0.9 ETH, which is not working for you and not actively staking. And this again is a centralization vector because like the really big stakers, they can, they, you know, for them, one ETH relative to all their stake is a, is a, is a tiny portion. And so, you know, the, the, the obvious solution here is just to reduce the increment, uh, maybe bring it down to one way so that we have a single balance on the beacon chain, not two separate balances. Uh, stop boundaries. Um, so this is, this is more of an aesthetic thing, uh, but for some reason, our 12 second slots don't start exactly at the minute. <laughs> they start kind of one second before the minute, which is kind of a bit arbitrary, a bit strange, um, and uh, yeah, uh, maybe a little unpolished. Okay, and, and you, know, uh, you know, I think that ideally we would have s aligned stock boundaries, but it's kind of, now that we've, we, while we have it, you know, changing it is actually quite difficult. <laughs> um, okay. Painful stuff that might be you know painful in in, in in the future. So one of them is the twelve uh, talking about slot durations, the the, the, the twelve second slot duration. So um, it turns out that you know just just like the fact that we have too many validators, the fact that we have a relatively short uh, slot slot time makes it difficult to to do certain upgrades like single slot finality and then enshrine TBS. And the reason is that these upgrades add new rounds of attestations within a single slot. So basically a single user level slot now has multiple system subslots. Um, and so if we stick with 12 seconds, now we have you know, six second subslots to do, to do these, these, these attestations and aggregations with potentially hundreds of thousands of validators and it becomes very difficult. And so the, the, the obvious fix here is to increase the, the, the slot duration. But um, I think just changing the value is going to be just uh, difficult. It's going to be a coordination nightmare. And I think some users or some DAP developers will push back on, on larger slot durations. So that's going to be an interesting uh, development. Another thing which you know, is a little bit uh, underwhelming is the, the sync committees. So th there isn't much adoption today. We have all this infrastructure for light clients uh, with the sync committees, but you know, not much adoption. And also the, the thing that's kind of annoying is that we don't need sync committees in the long term. It's just a piece of temporary infrastructure until we have like a fully snarked beacon chain, uh, you know, which is your light client. And so it's kind of over time gonna be a piece of technical debt, uh, which maybe we should, we should consider removing or at least removing some of the incentives attached to it so that we, we reduce the cost of, of sync committees. Um, uncapped penalties. I mean, this is a bit more of a you know, bleeding edge and like maybe more controversial thing, but basically um, today, if you want to build a rocket pool style um, uh, liquid staking token, uh, it's not fully trustless. Uh, and there's a very easy fix at the beacon chain level, which is just to cap the amount of penalties. So for every 32 ETH validator, for example, we could cap the penalties to just four ETH. Um, so if you, if you get slashed, maximum you lose is four ETH. If you go offline and you start leaking, maximum you lose is four ETH. And then the 28 ETH is now like guaranteed kind of uh, unslashable. Um, and so now you can build rocket pool where like the, 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 the R ETH is like as good as, it, as if it was built natively, almost like an enshrined uh, liquid staking token. 
Um, so yeah, that's a, that's a possibility. It's a very easy fix, technically, uh, but uh, I guess we need to, to look into the consequences. And then here, okay, this is a bit of a, uh, uh, an interesting one. Basically, if we're going to increase, and we I think we will increase the um, the the, s the maximum uh, effective balance to, to, or even remove the the maximum effective balance, now basically people will be making deposits that are much larger than 32 ETH. Um, and in order to re retain the fairness of making deposits we need the amount of gas used to be proportional to the, to, to the deposit. Um, so if you deposit, for example, 64 ETH, that should cost twice as much as depositing 32 ETH. If you deposit a million ETH, that should be you know, correspondingly larger. Um, and right now, the, the way that the gas scheduling works for the, for the deposit contract, first of all, it kind of, is, it varies depending on like, if you get lucky or unlucky with the Merkle tree, uh, but it also is not, is not fair, is not, um, scale to be uh, to, 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 to stake, basically. Um, and you know, here, the, the obvious fix, which if we had done it earlier back then, it would, you know, would have been very easy, but now the deposit contract is like a, a piece of infrastructure that, that's very, very hard to, to remove, so we kind of stuck with it. And then I think this is my final slide, which is uh, BLS signatures. So I think BLS signatures have been, uh, have been really successful, but the one thing that will come by to us in maybe 10, 15 years is that they're, they're not quantum secure. Uh, and so we're going to have to kind of rip everything out and also remove other pieces of cryptography which are not uh, quantum secure. Um, and, you know, it's possible that we have to rip out so much cryptography and, and redo so much of the internals uh, that we kind of have like Beacon Chain 2.0 or Ethereum 3.0. Uh, and I guess at that point, there will be an opportunity to just clean up all the technical debt and have a design which is, you know, essentially, uh, you know, close, close to perfect. And that, um, that's it. Thank you. Now, let me, let me ask Justin first, because I know you're on a tight time frame. Do you have time for questions or no? I can take one or two questions, yes. Two questions. Who would like them? <laughs> two questions. Anyone? Do we have a quantum secure algorithm that supports aggregation, signature aggregation? Yes. So uh, the cryptography team within the Ethereum Foundation has been looking into that quite a bit. Um, basically, we, at a minimum, we have uh, Fry-based, uh, basically similar to the Stark technology uh, signatures, and 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 you can do recursion of snarks in order to do the aggregation. There's something even more uh, efficient, uh, which is basically uh, lattice-based. So lattices is this uh, very promising piece of post-quantum cryptography, um, which still has like these, 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 these powerful properties with the, the homomorphisms. And so we can get maybe similar things to BLS signatures where you just add the signatures together uh, and, then, and then they just magically aggregate. All right, and just uh, one last question, maybe I'll, I'll throw at you here, is of, of the ones that you covered, uh, there were quite a lot of uh, maybe yeah. things in hindsight. What is your level of confidence about how many of those could be fixed in the future and how many of those we'll just have to live with? Yeah, so um, I think the good news is that most of them can be fixed. And if we're thinking about you know, Ethereum 3.0, uh, then you know, everything can be <laughs> fixed. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, the good news is that like the really like the worst one, which is probably like the 32 ETH validators, that, that's something that we can fix. There's an EIP for it. It's called increasing max effective balance. I think it's a no brainer. I think we should do this as soon as possible. Um, and so uh, I'm, I'm hoping it will happen, uh, maybe not in the ho next hard fork, but the one after that. Excellent. Yeah. All right, well, thank you again very much for your time today. Everyone. Thank you. Thank you.